We talked about there being six phases to goal creation. And I think probably everyone knows, they may not know there's six, but I think you know that there would have to be some kind of a process, a pattern. When you think of plants growing in your home or in your garden, I have, um, I have a beautiful studio. It's really, it's, a, it's actually a little television station. I can broadcast all over the world. It's 50 feet from my back door. It's in my own backyard. And it is, I love it. I go out there, and the music is always playing, very quiet music, Carl Dow. And it's just very quiet. And the only time the music comes shut off, I'll throw a switch if I'm recording. When I moved into the studio, first day it was open, Sandy sent me a beautiful big plant. Then at some other point, I forgot, maybe it was a birthday, she sent me another one. I have, oh, and she sent me a money tree. So I've got this big plant from opening day, and then I've got the big plant, I think, birthday or something, and the money tree. And these things grow so well in there. The energy is so good in there. It's quiet, quiet energy. It's very creative energy. It's all create. It's all we talk about in there. This is all we do is create in that place. And those plants love it. I remember Vandewell, mentor of mine, we did a seminar. It was called the Million Dollar Forum. And the first one we did, we did in the Laurentians in the mountains. The Million Dollar Forum is where Chicken Soup for the Soul books came from. The program was set up to teach people to earn a million dollars by setting up multiple sources of income. Um, we had the tables. It was a classroom tile, tile setup. And so there would be chairs right down in a row. We had a little single vase with one rose in it in front of every person. There was a woman that sat near the front, and every day her rose died. Yeah. And I remember Vanderwall saying, I wouldn't want to live in the house where flowers couldn't grow. I thought, that's a good point. I think that's why I love the studio so much. The energy is so incredible in there. And the plants show it. They grow. I think we know there's a process with all of life. Um, the moment of conception. And then over 280 days, there's a process taking place. And then the baby makes its debut on the planet in physical form. So we know these things, but do we really think for every goal there's a process? I believe that you'd accept that. You may have thought of it, you may not have thought of it, but you think, yeah, that makes sense. Well, where do we start? This is where we start. Where am I going? Where am I going? See, Phil said, I want an Oscar. I said, I can show you how to do that. And one of the first things I told him, I said, you ought to start walking, talking, working, living, being, as if you've already earned an Oscar. And you earn it. You don't win it. You earn it. So, you don't operate where I hope this happens sometime. You've got to walk like you've already got it. Let me read you something. We've got it in here in the program somewhere.
determined imagination, thinking from the end, is the beginning of all miracles. The future must become the present in the imagination of the one who would wisely and consciously create circumstances. We must translate vision into being. Thinking of into thinking from. Imagination must center itself in some state and then view the world from that state. Thinking from the end is an intense perception of the world of fulfilled desire. See, that's where Scott says perception is so important. I guess it is. So, if he sees himself already, he's already earned the Oscar, he would walk and talk and work and treat life like he was an Academy Award winner. Well, this is where we start. Now, not many people live that way, because if you're acting like you're already there, somebody will say, who do you think you are? What are you doing that for? Come on, get with it, for God's sake. Who do you think you are? You're gonna, people are going to laugh at you. Listen. I, I don't know if these statistics are accurate, but I'm inclined to believe they are. With, they come out so many different ways. If 97% seem to be going on the wrong track, what are the odds of you being with someone at any particular time that's on the right track. You see, if you don't consciously and deliberately choose the people you're going to associate with, um, the odds of you picking up good information is pretty slim. I am very selective about the people I spend a lot of time with. I don't think I'm better than anybody. I, in fact, I know I'm no better than anybody. I know we are all the same. We are all descendants from the same stock. I mean, we're, 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 we're really all the same. There's only one mind. But there's a lot of people that don't understand that they're the same as somebody that's doing very well. So they don't see themselves doing very well. I don't want to spend a lot of time with anybody that's not goal-oriented. I don't want to spend a lot of time with anybody that doesn't know exactly where they're going to go. I don't want to spend time with anyone that wants to play it safe because I might catch what they've got. I went into prisons, um, security, maximum security in Canada. This was the big place. I went in once a month for five years. I got to know them very well. I got to know how to speak their language, because if you don't speak their language, not going, you're not going to communicate effectively. I mean, you didn't call it guard to guard. There were screws. You see? And anyway, I got to learn their language, and I communicated effectively. And I'll tell you a story about it later on. Part of it's funny. And, um, part of it's very interesting. Um, but, you know, everybody leaving there, almost everybody, knew they were going back. When they leave, the, the screwed say, you'll be back. And I'll say, don't hold your breath. But they knew they were going, even the con knew they were going back. Recidivism rate is up around 85, 90%. That means out of eight or nine, out of 10, people that have done their time and leave, they go back. And some of them spend almost their whole life there. They don't get life. They get six years. They're on the street for six months, they're back for four years. They're on the street for six months, they're back in for three years. And they go back in for nine years. And they're just in and out their whole life. Recidivism rate is way up there. Why? Well, all they do is deal with criminals. All they talk about is crime. That's all they think about, so that's who they are. You go into a welfare area, there's a place in Toronto called... Um, um, some park, I forgot the name of the damn place now. Anyway, Regent Park. And I remember many years ago, back in the 50s, um, 
there was ramshackle old houses, and this was right downtown Toronto. And these houses were falling apart. I mean, they were just falling apart. Yet the city took over and tore them all down and built beautiful big apartment buildings. Well, do you know they just finished tearing those apartment buildings down? See, they took the people out of the slums, but they didn't take the slums out of the people. 85 to 90 percent of people that grow up in welfare area live in a welfare. That's where they go. Welfare recipients, almost all welfare, or fourth, fifth, sixth generation welfare recipients. Why? Carl Menninger pointed out that environment is more important than heredity. You've got to really watch what you're doing, who you're mixing with. Um, I have a lot of people, I'll be 85 my next birthday, a lot of people say, how do you stay so young? I don't hang around old people. Now, and I, I was saying that as a bit of a joke one time, and I realized it's true. I really don't. I spend very little time with anyone my age. Almost all the people I hang around, 50, 55. I mean, Sandy be about as old as they come. <laughs> now, I imagine she's watching that, and that's not going to get her. <laughs> that was her. <laughs> Send love. <laughs> you know. No, but you see, this, this is important. Now, if, if you're just spending time with a certain group of people, and you're not taking a look. See, some people don't pay any attention to that. You should pay attention to it. Most people have no idea where they're going. They really don't. And you don't have to <laughs> be much of a genius to figure this out. Stand back and watch the way most people live. Watch the way they operate. The way they talk, the way they walk, the way they act. The way they dress, everything about them is an indication that there's nothing but confusion in here. They start doing this, and they stop, and they go over here, and they start that, and they leave it, and they go over here, and they're doing this. They never get anything done. They're all over the damn place. There's no order. Now, I'm not the most orderly worker. And I, there's a lot of things I didn't want to learn how to do. So I delegate it. You get an assistant. I think if you're going to build anything, you should have an assistant. You've got to have a good assistant. You see? I think that's very important. So I have orderly people around me. I've got just the most phenomenal team of people that you ever want. I mean, you talk to anybody in this company. I, I'm, I'm just proud to work with any of them. I mean, they're that, they're that good. They really are. Um, I don't run the company. I just work here. Sometimes. You know. Sandy runs the company. And she, um, she didn't think I'd be able to do that. She says, you've got to do what I say. I said, okay. And when she took over, she didn't think I'd be able to do that. She says, usually when that happens person leaves the company when somebody else comes in as CEO. And I said, well, I'm not going anywhere. She does a phenomenal job. And if you ask her, she'll tell you, and she'll tell you the truth. I do what she wants done. Some of it I don't agree with. I don't agree with it at all. And sometimes I tell her I don't, but usually I don't. I just do what she says. Because I know that she's on the right track. The results indicate she's on the right track. We're growing. We're profitable. We're doing the right thing. We're going in the right direction. You see? You've got to know where you're going, and then you've got to pay attention to how in the hell you're going to get there. How do you do that? Do you have to know how to get there? No. You don't. But you've got to pay attention. For you to live like you're already there, you're going to have to disrupt yourself. There's no question about it. Okay? You've really got to do it. Now, the next part is it can't be done. You know? Well, it can be done. And we're going to go in. We're going to talk about these people that say it can't be done. Well, that can't be done. I'll never be able to do that. Well, it can be done. But we've got some good examples for you. 
And then, who am I? The average individual hasn't got the foggiest idea who they are. They really don't know who they are. They hear that they're God's highest form of creation. Well, what does that really mean? That means I'm more than the trees or the squirrels or something like that. We're created in God's image. Now, I'm not teaching religion. I'm not qualified to do it. And I don't even want you to get the idea that I'm trying to. But I'll tell you this. We are truly created in God's image. Now, the problem most of us have, we got that equation reversed, and we created God in our image. And that causes any amount of trouble. Well, you've got to get this straightened out. Who am I? When I started to study this, I, I couldn't have answered that question. I said, what do you mean, who am I? I'm Bob. What, what are you talking about? You know who I am. But I'm not Bob. I'm not. That's my name, but that's not me. Say, well, this is me. No, no, this isn't me. This is my body. My body. You've never heard anyone say, am hand. We don't say that. We say, my hand. My leg. My head. My name. But that's not me. Now, you see... Most individuals, they never entertain what I've just said. They don't let that run around their mind. Who am I? Listen. If I'm going to act like the person I want to become, I better know who I am. I was... Um, yeah, I will. Um, Every now and then I get ideas and I have to digress. I was standing way back in the back corner of the room at the um, O'Hare Hyatt. This is way back, years ago, the late 60s. Um, I was very shy. I had low self-esteem, but I was very shy. Um, if I was with a group of people just the size maybe at one table, I wouldn't ask a question. I would just sit there. I, I, wouldn't, I would never speak up. I would be quiet. I would never hold up my hand to volunteer to do anything. I was shy. Well, what does that mean? I had very low self-esteem. I had a low opinion of myself. I had the strongest desire to teach this. As odd as it may seem, I was doing very well with this poor image. It was a poor image socially, but I started and I developed... My image, we have an image in many different ways. That's why Gurdjieff talks about the many eyes of the personality. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I do this. Well, I, um, I wanted to teach this. You see, when Diane was saying the story about me with the, the guy in the cassette where I was so embarrassed, I didn't want to be a speaker. Earl Nightingale was not a speaker. He, he would speak, um, I speak, and they pay me a lot of money sometimes to do it. But that, I don't see myself as a speaker. I never have. It's not something I wanted to do. But I had an enormous desire to teach this. Yet it was so good. And I'm thinking it's essential. People got to learn this. And I knew it very well. And I didn't think it, wonder it worked. I knew it worked. I did it. Yet, like the Wright brothers didn't care who said you can't fly. They said, I know I can. I just did. You see? And it's a different thing. So, I'm in the back of the room, and Bill Gove has a handheld mic, and he's standing there. There's about 1,000 people in the room, 500 here, 500 there. It was a middle aisle. He was standing here. Bill Gove was the best speaker I ever heard. Man was phenomenal. And, and he, he became a very good friend. Anyway, I didn't even know him. But I'm in the back corner, and he's standing here. He's got his hand up. And he said, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. Not the me I think my wife thinks I should be. Not the me I think my kids think I should be. If I want to be free, I've got to be me. 
Not the me I think you think I should be. If I want to be free, I got to be me. Now he said, I better know who me is. I'm in the back of the room and I'm thinking, God, I'm so good at this. I could only do that. If I could only do that. Well, in Earl Nagel's Lead the Field, the first recording is on additive. And at one point in that recording, he said, no, right here we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can accomplish, and for some equally strange reason, we think others can do things that we cannot. He said, I want you to realize that that is not true, that you have deep reservoirs of talent and ability. And I'm listening to that, and if you said you understand that, I say, of course I understand it. I didn't understand it at all. I bet I had listened to that at least a thousand times, maybe two. For years I'd been listening to it. Here he is saying, yep, I want to be free. And, and I've been thinking, if only I could do that. He can, but I can't. You know. And all of a sudden, that damn record started to play in my head. Now, right here, we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we... Thought, That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. That moment, I became aware of the truth in what I'd been listening to for a few years. Our problem is, we have been trained to read the book, and then we think we've got it. You could read the book and not have it at all. If you read the same thing over and over and over and you're relaxed and you look at it and you think, what did he really mean? Get into their head. Understand what they're saying. I didn't understand it. I thought I did because I'd listen and I'd listen so often. I made up my mind right then I not only was going to learn, not only going to learn it, I was going to get him to teach me. And Bill Gove became my mentor, my coach. And he taught me how to do what I'm doing right now. Now, I don't speak anything like Bill Gove. He was, he was the Frank Sinatra of speakers. I don't speak anything like him. You see... He didn't teach me anything about speaking. He taught me something about me. He taught me to be totally comfortable talking to you. That's all I had to do. If I'm very comfortable talking to you, I will express whatever I want to express. I'll share what's inside. Most people are not comfortable in public speaking because their focus is all on themselves. All they're thinking about is themselves. And they're thinking, I wonder what she thinks of me. I wonder what he thinks. I wonder if they like what I'm doing. Do they like my tie? My tie? Is, that, is my shirt? You know. The focus is all on self. You couldn't possibly be effective doing that. I've got one focus. I want you to understand this like I do, and I will do everything that comes to my mind. I will say whatever comes into my mind if I think it will help you understand it. Well, what I really had to get was that if Bill could do it, Bob could do it. All I wanted to do was do it. I just wanted to do this. Some of you are going to fall in love with this. You'll really fall in love with it. It's so easy to do. Because you see, I think you are genetically programmed to want to help people. I believe that. I believe you're programmed to want to help people. There's something in you. There's a gene in you 
or possibly there's a part of every gene in you, everyone, that you want to help people. It's instinctive. It's part of who we are. I said instinctive. It's not instinctive. It's just programmed right into our genes. Well, if you want to do what we're doing, you can do it. And you can do it with us. I'd love you to do it with us. Elma, out in Orange County. Elma, I hope you're watching again, because I'm really glad you decided to work with us, and I'm going to work with you. And you tell me what you want, Elma, and I'm going to show you how to get it. I will. And as long as you keep telling me, I will show you. And if you don't believe it'll work, go and ask Phil. See, that's the way it works. Now, if we don't take time to understand who we are, if I don't take time to understand who I am, it won't much matter where I'm going. It won't matter, much matter who I'm doing it with. Because I'm living in ignorance about the most important thing in the world, who I am. There's something absolutely phenomenal locked up in you, right in your core of your being. And this is the truth. If you can see it here, you can hold it here. Yes, you can entertain the idea, you can cause it to move into form because you are in harmony or can be in harmony with the laws that govern your being. You can get in harmony with God's laws and when you do, then you can make anything happen. Anything. People say, well, there's limits. Well, if that's what you think, then there will be. I hope you enjoyed this video. We put a lot of good information up here and it causes everything in your life to get better. If you'd like us to notify you every time we put a new video up, hit subscribe and then turn on notifications. Check out all our videos and we will notify you when we put a new one up.